is this. Young people have things to say. And I bet every parent and teacher who's sitting out here can agree with me that sometimes it's not exactly what we want to hear. But more often than not, students have ideas, they have questions, uh, and they have insights, and they want to share those. Last year, 14 courageous young people took a risk and responded to the call of three teachers with an idea, and TED Talks was born. The 2014 TED Talks ranged from the art of video game, video games, to how to address world hunger, to the problems with cell phones in interpersonal relations. And the result was nothing short of amazing. For weeks after Jed, young people, teachers, parents, members of the community, and even superintendents continued in the dialogue that began that evening. The buzz created by last year's Jed encouraged us to continue in our efforts to help young people to find their voices and to help a community to engage in dialogue. The 16 young people ready to take the stage tonight have spent countless hours researching, practicing, supporting, and encouraging each other as they worked to create engaging and passionate TED Talks. Ms. Connick, Ms. Romeiser, and I have totally enjoyed working with these terrific young people and witnessing the collaborative effort as they cultivated their ideas to fruition. At its best, education is about ideas. It's about open-mindedness. It's about collaboration. Jed rises to the challenge of all of these criteria. Tonight, these young people are here to share with you their ideas, passions, and emotions. We invite you to sit back, chew on some great ideas, and prepare to enter the dialogue as you experience Jed 2015. Jet event. My name is Macy Whitbuck. And I'm Rachel Fairbanks. And we will be your MCs for tonight. To get the event rolling, we will first hear from senior Amanda Mikesell. Amanda is actively involved in JD's Model United Nations Club, where she has received numerous awards and titles for her hard work. Here's Amanda discussing the importance of open mindedness with her talk, A Model Mind. Open-mindedness. I believe this word has the power to change each of our lives, our community, our country, and our world as a whole. In simple terms, open-mindedness is the ability to be receptive towards new beliefs, ideas, or opinions. Now think about that for a minute. The ability to be receptive of new points of view. I believe a plague of our modern day society is the willingness to argue but there's a lack of that same willingness to keep an open mind and be receptive towards new ideas. I've seen this manifest from interpersonal relationships to the way we're taught in schools, even to how our government functions, or for that matter, doesn't function. As many of you may know, a large part of my life has been my involvement in Model United Nations, or MUN. MUN has literally forced me to be open-minded because every conference I've been to, I've been debating world issues from the point of view of a different country. I've represented Morocco, Angola, the Czech Republic, and the list goes on. At each conference, I've had to embody the beliefs of each nation and present their ideals as if they were my own. And on top of all that, I've been in committee with other kids representing other countries who may or may not agree with the points of view of the nation I'm representing. But, as simulators of the United Nations, we all work together to come up with compromises and make a point of listening to the points of view of even our most bitter rivals. So, what does that have to do with my talk? Well, I believe MUN has allowed me to grow immensely as an open-minded individual. I've learned to have strong opinions, but I've also learned to be receptive towards new information and points of view. I've learned to really listen to others and give their opinions the respect they deserve. And, most importantly, I've learned to have discussions instead of arguments. 
I'm sure you can all think of problems in modern day society caused by a lack of open-mindedness. One that comes readily to my mind are the standoffs we've witnessed in our government in recent years. Democrats and Republicans and the like insist that their views are right, and both sides are certainly eager to um, convey their displeasure with the other side's beliefs and opinions. Yet, with this mindset, we wonder why nothing ever gets done. Instead of exercising open-mindedness and compromise, our government consistently exercises blame, neither side relenting. This crosses over even into our school. I'm sure we can all think of times where we've either been a part of or witnessed a political argument that gets absolutely nowhere. In fact, it's almost a small representation of our government. The knock-down, drag-out fights I've seen certainly aren't pretty, and neither side leaves being anything except more angry at the other. In fact, it's turned a lot of people in our school off of politics. They don't even want to bring it up. Which is really a shame. How can we expect an educated population of voters when we're turning each other off of the important issues that face us in our future? Better yet, if we can't function person to person, party to party, in our own country, how can we hope to do so in our increasingly global community? I can say as someone who's learned a lot about a lot of different countries, that the differences in opinions between Democrats and Republicans pale in comparison to the differences of opinions between world culture. So, what can you do? How can you try to be more open-minded? For the adults in this room who are probably reluctant to take advice from an 18-year-old, I implore you to listen to what I have to say. Parents, foster educated opinions amongst your children. Guide them towards making their own decisions even if their beliefs don't coincide with your own. Pushing them towards what you think is right and what you think is right alone doesn't promote open-mindedness. Educators, allow your students to explore both history and the present with an open mind. And don't fear for our future if students bring opinions that don't necessarily correlate with yours. Encourage discussion and educate us so that we can come to logical conclusions on our own. And lastly, and most importantly, students, the young people in the audience. Stop trying to shove each other down for having different points of view. Stop calling each other names. And yes, calling someone ignorant does count. If you believe someone is lacking information, then share information with them. But do it in a nice way. You will never get someone to listen to you by attacking them and you do a disservice to any cause you advocate for by presenting it in such a negative light. Listen to others. Really listen. Don't just wait for gaps in their speech where you can squeeze your thoughts in. And lastly, and most importantly, educate yourselves. Don't just ally yourselves with the popular beliefs and opinions of your friends, your family, and your community. Become knowledgeable on these topics. Gather information, discuss things with others, but in the end, draw your own conclusions. I honestly believe if we take these steps, make a conscious effort to keep an open mind and discuss instead of argue, that we're not doing only ourselves a favor, but we're doing a favor to our future generations and our world as a whole. Thank you.
That's not what I'm trying to do today. Today, I want to tell you about the fans that make up and support the Harry Potter franchise. The same fans that are the foundation of perhaps the greatest and most underappreciated movement. Because what movement could grow out of a children's fantasy book? Let me tell you about the Harry Potter generation. To start off, I'm going to tell you the story of the Harry Potter fan. It is, in my opinion, the best story out there. It's mine. <laughs> Harry Potter has been around since before I was born. My parents said it, I was my older brother, and then my older sister. I remember listening to the audio tapes in the car in the car rides. Funny enough, though, I hated reading and despised the books. This was in part due to frustration because when I was six, I tried to read The Source of Stone, couldn't read anything, and threw it across the room. Eventually, though, I did read the books, and I've read the whole series at least ten times since. But that's not the point. The point is, once I started reading the books and entering the world of Hogwarts, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't wait to go there. I mean, obviously, I am a wizard. It would be accurate to say that I was pretty excited about getting my Hogwarts letter on my 11th birthday. Lo and behold, my birthday came, and I got my letter. I was going to Hogwarts. Obviously, my parents didn't let me go. But the Hogwarts letter wasn't the only thing at my spot that day. And perhaps the greatest move ever made by parents, I also received a letter from Teddy Lupin, Remus Lupin's in and Fedora Thompson's son. I corresponded with Teddy for three years, fully believing that he and the wizarding world feel that someday I would go there. Eventually the truth came out, and I stopped writing to Teddy. It wasn't real, it was just a story, just to put me in bed, to bed at night. But that's the great thing about stories. Just because they play out inside your head doesn't make them any less real. Harry Potter has reached an estimate of 200 countries. It is translated in over 69 languages. Harry Potter has touched the lives of over 400 million people. And those 400 million are giving back. And some of them don't even know it. Along with creating the new sport of Muggle Quidditch, Harry Potter has changed how people interact with the world. A new study published in the Journal of Applied Social Psychology found that reading the Harry Potter books improved attitudes to the stigmatized groups of children among both peers and adults. Furthermore, an American study by, conducted by Harvard in 2008 found that in general, Fans of Harry Potter tend to not only be more open to diversity, but be, to be more politically tolerant and active, and less likely to be in favor of deadly force of use of torture. Some people, however, are in possession of the dramatic effect Harry Potter has had on the world. One such organization is the Harry Potter Alliance. Formed in 2005, the Alliance is a not-for-profit organization that has over 300 chapters in 45 nations. This organization uses the intrinsic enthusiasm and community within fans, along with the power of story, to drive people's and social activism. The Alliance has sent five program points to Haiti, helpful libraries all over the world, and just this past summer, 2014, they accomplished the feat of assuring that all Harry Potter brand or associated chocolate around the world will be free trade or eat certified, instead of being made in sweatshops or child labor. Harry Potter is the story that crosses all social, religious, racial, gender, and age divides that typically separates people and brings us all together. Today, I have told you how a story shaped a generation. Harry Potter was an exceptionally brave and sometimes stupid person. But most importantly, he was a fierce, fierce friend. Even though he isn't real, and we have never met him, 
Head has been with us through it all. You see, He Pada was the boy we all wanted to be. He stood up for what he believed in and was right. He taught us to be kind and caring, to stand up for what we believed in. Now, the strong has ended. But the legacy J.K. Rowling's Hey Pada has left behind reminds me, reminds us, that though we may come from different countries and speak in different tongues, our hearts beat as one. In light of that story that began 25 years ago, that crossed all conceded boundaries of mankind, the bonds of friendship made throughout the journey are more important than ever. You remember that and will celebrate a boy who created a generation that is kind and brave and true. A generation that knows magic is real, even if you have to make it yourself. A generation that's stuck with hay, right to the very end. Remember Hay Potter, and remember the Potter generation. Thinking is 
purposely putting your mind on something, while feeling is accepting whatever thoughts come to your mind. This may be uncomfortable at first. I cry during meditation. Sometimes I get a little sleepy, but that may be frowned upon. The stillness of med you may feel a tingling sensation or a burst of energy. The stillness of meditation lets us begin to witness how we respond to life through our emotional and mindful responses. It gives us a realistic perspective of what we are actually feeling. Imagine how beneficial this could be for you high school students, dealing with homework, tests, sports practices, rehearsals, or the daily hecticness that comes along with being a teenager. Meditation has brought Western and Eastern medicine together, a previously poor relationship, and has found major health benefits. The Journal of American Medical Associates of Internal Medicine recently published that meditation can be as useful as antidepressants, if not more, to treat depression. It is also said that mindfulness can enhance attention regulation, body awareness, emotional regulation, and changes in self-perspective. There are also simple meditation exercises that increase the amount of chromosomes in your body linked with anti-aging. A 2005 study led by psychologists at Yale found that the brains of American men and women who meditated just 40 minutes a day were slowing down the process of aging by increasing attention, decision making, and memory skills seen in the cortical walls of the brain. 40 minutes may sound like a lot of time to you, but compared to the seven and a half hours teens spend daily watching TV, going on social media, or playing video games, it isn't that much. People claim they don't have time for meditation, but the truth is, they have too much time for things that won't matter in the long run. Thanks to all the studies that have been done, the practice of meditation has grown. Patterson High School in the Baltimore City School District recently adopted a Mindful Moments program, which is a 15-minute meditation program at the beginning and end of the day. It allows teachers and students to focus their brains to prepare for learning at the beginning of the day, and at the end of the day, they slow their brain down again after all the lessons have been done. To figure out how beneficial meditation is in the real world, Brown University adopted a, a new study called Contemplative Studies. In this class, students can either study different practices and styles of meditation, or learn how the brain processes meditation. After they take some meditation classes and kind of study what they're feeling, they go back and talk about these in lectures and discussions. Programs like these have grown to Brown University, that's at Brown University. <laughs> Programs like these have grown to NYU, Stanford, UVA, and Rice University. And meditation is often offered as a physical education course at most colleges. CEOs of some of the top companies in the world meditate. Ray Dalio, Bill Ford, Oprah Winfrey, and Ariana Huffington, to name a few. They say meditating on a daily basis helps with their creative thinking, productivity, and lower stress levels. Even athletes like Michael Jordan, Derek Jeter, Misty Mae Schrainer, and Carrie Walsh Jennings work with sports psychologists to help them meditate and increase their focus. There are so many possibilities for how and who meditation can benefit. A soldier returning with PTSD, a cancer patient going through chemotherapy, or even a perfectly healthy person who could just use a good 40 minutes in silence. I'm not saying it's easy. It's been four years since I received this book, and I haven't gone straight 30 days through it. But I'm saying it's worth it. Meditation has many layers to it each being unraveled every time you meditate. So tonight, before going to bed, instead of staring blankly at the glare of your phone, listen to a guided meditation playlist on Spotify, or simply focus on your breathing and let it go. Namaste.
the characters and lessons in anime. Let's hear what AJ has to say as we listen to his Gen Talk, Animation in Modern Society. In the 50s, people thought TV was rotting and broke. In the 90s to early 2000s, they thought playing video games made you synonymous with crazed killers like the Columbine shooter. Today, anime is one of the few forms of entertainment that people still make broad generalizations about. Now, in tonight's program, there's a lot of talks with common themes such as understanding or dispelling stereotypes, and I feel like these elements definitely have a place here. Many people either don't know what anime is or have large misconceptions about it. When I tell people that I founded the anime club at this school and have led it successfully for three years, they think all we do is fanboy about shows like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon, marketing vehicles geared to kids in hopes of getting them to spend all their parents' money. When I never really got this, why in such a medium with vast potential as anime, would you put in a box like this? You don't need your actors in an animated setting to match the character's gender, ethnicity, or anything like that, all as long as their voice is in sync with the character. So hopefully, by the end of my talk, I've gotten you to see the second dimension in a brand new way. Now, first off, let me start by clarifying what I mean by anime. Anime is generally considered to be anime from Eastern cultures, specifically Japan. And as you can see here, the difference between anime and Western animation, generally cartoons, is pretty obvious to see. In cartoons, you generally have more simplistically designed characters, generally they're anthropomorphic creatures instead of humans, and generally the storyline is more episodic so that kids can jump in at any time. Now, while anime can meet all of these criteria as well, they generally aim for an older audience and are more plot-driven, so as you have to watch an episode one. Now, another source of confusion when it comes to anime is this preconception people's head that it is a genre instead of a medium. Now, let me break down what this means. In a genre, you have generally a couple of elements or tropes that are found throughout each work pretty much. For example, in a gangster film, you know that generally his crime is going to catch up with him at some point. However, in a medium, you actually contain several genres within yourself. There's obviously a large difference between video games like Mario Kart and Grand Theft Auto. And the same applies to anime. I've seen anime of all different kinds, ranging from slice of life comedies to gritty military dramas and everything in between. There's even been anime that fall outside of all genres and some that have their hands in multiple genres. Now, let me just pose a question to you. Would you dismiss every book you read just because you read Fifty Shades of Grey? Would you dismiss every movie you watched just because you saw Michael Bay. I think not. Think about how ridiculous it is to dismiss an entire medium just because you happen across one weird, strange entry in passing. You have to actually look within the medium in depth and find works that suit your tastes. Now, another reason that people cite as their reason for not getting into anime is culture shock. After all, since it comes from a place that is Halfway across the world from us, people feel that it must be too alien or that they won't get any of the jokes or references. And while this is true to some extent, generally most themes, characters, and references in anime are actually homages to popular Western culture. There have been anime that have taken a page out of Tarantino's playbook, and there have even been anime characters based off of popular people like Clint Eastwood. Don't believe me? Here's Clint Eastwood meeting with Hirohiko Araki, the creator of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, in which he actually based his main character, JoJo, off of the man himself. 
Now, this influence is not only going from west to east. Many known and famous directors and actors, such as Wes Anderson and the late great Robin Williams, are known anime fans who like to sneak in little references and homages where they can. For example, as you see here in the film One Hour Photo, Robin Williams actually managed to get a piece of merchandise from his favorite anime, Neon Genesis Evangelion, into one of the scenes that wasn't as significant. Now, anime has also influenced Western cartoons. I want to break out of the mold that I described earlier. Shows like the Boondocks and the Avatar franchise break out of the standard cartoon mold by including more detailed animation and more serious topics. Anime studios have even helped make popular Western franchises, such as work on Batman the Animated Series, Halo Legends, part of the Halo video game franchise, and The Animatrix, a series of animated shorts that tie into the Matrix universe. Speaking of The Matrix, the entire Matrix franchise was actually based on an anime known as Ghost in the Shell. So, now that I've talked to you about anime, what can you do? Where can you go to really get immersed in it and see it for yourself? Well, thankfully, we live in the time of a marvelous little invention known as Netflix, or Hulu Plus if you prefer. Streaming sites like this and many others have recently been adding a wide variety of anime to their catalog. So, after this talk is over, or next time you're done watching House of Cards or Orange is the New Black, why don't you look into a different genre pool and see if it suits your tastes? Thank you. Doing our part. Hi everyone. So tonight I want to talk to you about our planet. I think our planet is so amazing and so I'll be studying environmental policy next year to do everything I can to preserve it. So I know not everyone has the money or the time to commit to living a hundred percent eco-friendly life, but everyone can make a few choices that can make a difference. And who doesn't want to keep our Earth beautiful and livable, right? First off, I'd like to start with recycling. Because it is one of the easiest and most routine things you can do for your planet, by far the most important and easiest thing to recycle is the water bottle. 86% of plastic water bottles are thrown away and not recycled. Considering that 60 million water bottles are used every day in the US, we can figure that 18 billion, 834 million water bottles end up in landfills every year. Each of these bottles can take up to 700 years to decompose. So if your family does buy plastic water bottles, make sure you have an easily accessible recycling bin next to the trash and encourage everyone in your house to recycle them. However, better than recycling is pre-cycling. Pre-cycling happens at the point of purchase and entails you choosing the product that comes in the least amount of packaging. So instead of picking smaller, more conveniently packaged foods like this, pick a bulk option with significantly smaller environmental impact. And please, don't buy these. Things like this can't happen anymore. It's just wasteful and ridiculous. We should not be heavily packaging fruits when they're naturally wrapped in biodegradable packaging, like peels and skins. <laughs> so, going back to the water bottle. You can pre-cycle by using a reusable water bottle and refilling it with tap water whenever you want, which is 2,000 times cheaper than buying water bottles, by the way. That's right, according to a study by Convergex Group Chief, Chief Market Strategist Nick Colas, a 16.9 ounce water bottle add up 16.9 ounce water bottles add up to about $7.50 per gallon. That is almost 2,000 times the cost of a gallon of tap water, and when this study was conducted, twice the cost of a gallon of gasoline. 
Now, with the price down a little bit, gas three times. So I suggest everyone go invest not only in their planet, but in their wallet and use a refillable water bottle. Recycling falls under the category of voting with your dollar, which is the concept that consumers cast a vote with each dollar they spend. So make your vote count and spend your dollar on earth-friendly products when you are grocery shopping. Okay, so we've been talking about some very direct ways to help the environmentalists, so my last piece here is pretty hands-off. And it is about solar panels. <laughs> now, if you didn't know, solar panels are very, very inefficient. Some of the best inorganic solar pa panels that we have are only about 22% efficient. While standard commercially available ones, such as the ones found on people's rooftops, only convert about 14% of their energy into usable energy. So, along with being very inefficient, inorganic solar panels are very expensive to produce and are difficult to, dis to dispose of. If the cost of current solar cells was reduced by a factor of 5 to 10, many countries would likely use solar cells to obtain 20% of their electricity from solar energy. So, the experts at Harvard's Department of Chemistry and Molecular Biology are working on the Clean Energy Project, which... which will develop the next generation of solar cells, organic solar cells which will be much more efficient and much easier to dispose of. Unfortunately, it will take their computers 22 years to do all of the necessary calculations. To speed this up, IBM's World Community Grid wants to run all of the necessary molecular mechanics calculations on the back of your computer. Using our spare computer capacity, the Clean Energy Project can be finished in just two years. This is really important, guys, and I hope you go home and download the software on your computer to speed up the process at worldcommunitygrid.org. So, in conclusion, recycle, or better yet, pre-cycle, and vote with your dollar on less harmful products. And go home and download this fabulous software, and we can all start doing our part. Thank you. don't know that or a lot of other things about pediatric cancer, even though it's the disease that kills the most kids every year, more than AIDS, asthma, cystic fibrosis, congenital deformities, and diabetes combined. A child is diagnosed with cancer every three minutes. That's 175,000 kids every single year. Every day, 250 of those kids pass away. But together, we can do something to change that. Between the ages of 0 and 20 years, one out of every 285 kids will be diagnosed with cancer. Let's look at that in the terms of a school like JD. We have a little less than 285 kids per grade. So let's say that in a given year, we have four kids diagnosed with cancer. 25% of kids who are diagnosed with cancer aren't going to survive. So let's say that the statistic holds true at JD. That leaves you with three kids. But you have to take into account that two-thirds of kids who survive cancer have lasting effects in their treatments, including blindness, deafness, infertility, heart failure, and even secondary cancers. This leaves you with only one child of the original four who survives into adulthood without lasting effects. Right now, you're probably thinking that there's something very wrong with these treatments, and you're right. 
Many treatments available today are outdated, but they're still in use because there's a serious lack of funding for pediatric cancer research. This seems a little backwards. I mean, kids, especially sick kids, should be a priority, right? Well, sadly, that's not how pharmaceutical companies and federal grant committees see things. 96% uh, of the money allocated by the federal government for cancer research goes to adult cancer research. The remaining 4% is all that's left for pediatric cancer research. Additionally, 60% of the money that funds new drug development for adult cancer is given by pharmaceutical companies. For pediatric cancer, the amount given by pharmaceutical companies for new drug development is so low, it rounds to 0%. Looking a little closer at the numbers, the average age of diagnosis of a child with cancer is 6, and the average number of years lost is 71. For adults, the average age of diagnosis is 67, and the average number of years lost is 15. These figures are significant for two reasons. One, the number of years lost by a child is far greater than the number of years lost by an adult. And two, it's the reason why adult cancer research doesn't help children. They're being affected by different types of cancer. Most pediatric cancers only affect people under a certain age, hence the name. And so, research done for adult cancers is not helping children. Additionally, children's bodies react differently than adults do, both to the cancers and to the treatments, so children really aren't being helped. Another big problem right now is when charities aren't charitable enough. Some known and trusted institutions, like the American Cancer Society and the Children's Cancer Fund, give less than 60% of their money to actual research. Many other organizations spend money on transporting kids to and from treatments, helping parents afford treatments, and making sure that kids are happy and comfortable as they can be during these treatments. Of course, these are all very important, but money isn't going to actual research. All of these problems together form what is known as the funding gap. The funding gap, simply put, is the lack of funding for pediatric cancer research. The most apparent outcome of the funding gap is seen in the number of new treatments available. For adults, 30 new drugs have been created in the past two years alone for cancer patients. For children, two new drugs have been created in the past 20 years. So when you donate, it's important to know where your money is going and how much of it is actually getting there. Websites like Charity Navigator can be helpful if you're doing research. And other websites up on the board are organizations that have high charitable ratings. So back to my boldness. These issues became apparent to me several years ago when a man from my synagogue participated in an event known as St. Baldrick's. That's where I got the school t-shirt. What began with a few CEOs down in New York City shaving their heads on St. Patrick's Day to raise money for a worthy cause has spiraled into an international organization that raises millions of dollars every single year. In the past 15 years, They've donated over $170 million to actual research all over the world, including to Upstate Hospital here in Syracuse. Participants are sponsored by their friends, family, and teachers to shave their heads, and not only does money go to a worthy cause, but these baldies then become a walking billboard for pediatric cancer. Trust me, if you walk into school one day with no hair, people are going to ask you what's going on. The Syracuse event, held annually at Kitty Coins, is consistently one of the biggest events worldwide. It was held this past Sunday, and so far, we've raised over $400,000, and we're in first place worldwide. Pediatric cancer can affect anyone, although most families think it'll never happen to me. The problem is, it can happen to you. It can happen to anyone, and it does every day, all over the world, in every community, including this one. At every St. Baldrick's event, 
We have what are known as honored children. These are sick kids from throughout the community whose parents, friends, family, and sometimes doctors will tell their stories at events. My first year attending St. Baldrick's, I remember hearing two stories that have always stuck with me, each given by a mother. The first mother went on stage and told a story about her daughter, who was at a birthday party that day. She talked about how her daughter had gone back and forth between wanting to attend the party and wanting to attend St. Baldrick's when her mother had convinced her to go to the party. Her reason was that she didn't know how many more of her daughter's friends would have birthdays before her daughter became too sick to attend the parties. The next mother up talked about her son, who had recently expressed a wish for the future, that his children would be born into a world where kids didn't get cancer anymore. This seemed like a great wish, except the mother explained that her son had been made infertile by his life-saving treatments and would never have children of his own. These stories made me realize, and I hope they've made you realize, that cancer doesn't just affect someone else, and it isn't just someone else's problem. It affects everyone, and it's everyone's problem. That's why we all must come together to fight it. So go shave your head or donate some money or educate yourself so you can better educate others. Together, we can fill the gap. Thank you. Next up, we have senior Julian David Drury. He's the president of JD's very own Green Actors Club and will be attending SUNY Geneseo this fall. Julian is here to share with us disorders that sometimes go unnoticed in today's society. Here's Julian with The Phantoms I've Known. Hello, everyone. I stand before you as a graduating high school senior who, over the course of my four years here at the high school, has founded and run a school club, maintained a high GPA, and in the fall, will be attending SUNY Geneseo. Now, I know, thank you. Now, I know that sounds pretty impressive, but it wasn't all handed to me on a silver plate. See, for as long as I can remember, I've been haunted by phantoms. Don't go run away with that idea. No, no, no. I, I'm not hallucinogenic. I, I'm not seeing things come out of the wall here. I'm talking about phantom learning disabilities, phantom learning disorders. Phantom, special needs. See, when most people think of special needs, two names come to mind. Autism and dyslexia. Now, I'm not saying these aren't important, I'm not saying they don't deserve funding or research. I'm simply saying they're not the only ones out there. And that's what my speech is on tonight. These disorders and disabilities that, as a general public, we may not hear about or we view with a cured mindset. These phantoms, the phantoms I've known, and a few I've had the misfortune of being along the way. So, I begin with phantom learning disabilities, specifically, dysgraphia. Now, if you've ever heard the term doctor's writing, dysgraphia takes it to a whole new level. Uh, anyway, um, on the board you see two pieces of writing. One, that of a perfectly normal first grader. The other, mine, from literally 15 minutes ago. Which one is which? The answer? They're both my handwriting. Now, if you can read that, you're a very talented person. You should really go on the road with that. If not, tough. Um, now, these represent something more than my teacher's eternal struggle to read my papers. They represent the three types of dysgraphia. First, motor. The way in which letters are formed. And as you can see, it's very scraggly. Next, spatial. The spacing in between words and letters. And as you can see, there is none. And finally, comprehension. What the writing says. Again, good luck with that. Um, so then there are other things that this graphic will do, such as make you take a long time to type or write items, and give you hand cramps when you type or write too much. Now for a young dysgraphic, too much can be anywhere from three paragraphs to five sentences. Not very much at all. Now next, I move to dyscalculia. And this is about math. Now, it's thought to be as common as dyslexia, but it doesn't share the inf same infamy. 
And there are a couple of reasons for this. First, there is no one type of dyscalculia. There are in fact many types, and thus many different sets of symptoms. So it's not as commonly diagnosed. Furthermore, people don't even know of it as a diagnosis, which further hinders our amount of knowledge as to how many people have it. That said, there are a few common symptoms. So for example, a difficulty remembering math formulas, such as a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or 2 plus 2, which equals 7. Um, also, the simple act of writing numbers can be difficult. It's like dysgraphia, math edition. Um, then we move on to the disorders, starting with dyspraxia. Now, go Charlie Brown. Um, dyspraxia is a difficulty in motor skills. Now, it affects both gross and fine motor skills. Gross motor skills are stuff that are big, like football. Now, you're probably wondering how Charlie Brown relates, other than football, considering he can play it all year round, he doesn't live in Syracuse. Um, and there's the common scene in every single cartoon. He runs to kick the football, Lucy picks it up the last second, and he falls flat on his face, and we all think it's absolutely hysterical. But if this happens to you, and the football hasn't moved, you may be dyspraxic. Then on the fine motor skills front, if you're playing video games and you're trying to move forward, but you're pressing the backward button, that may also be dyspraxia at work. Now there's another type of dyspraxia, often more severe, apraxia. We may know it as apraxia of speech, which is difficult to pronouncing words and letters. I then move on to slow executive functioning. Now slow executive functioning has a whole litany of issues that it causes. For example, reading time on an analog clock or even the amount of time you take to take a test, such as the Regents. So, the regular time of the Regents is three hours. However, if you have slow executive functioning, you may get 1.5 time, four and a half hours, or double time, six hours. Imagine, six hours with the algebra two Regents. <sighs> I still have nightmares. Um, then I move to VPD, or Visual Processing Disorder. This is not VPD. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just going to continue. Um, VPD, what you would be seeing is um, that one is our friend the Martian, I think anyway. So the, the Martian is um, the Martian. He's having trouble figuring out shapes and colors, and that's what VPD is. It also affects, of course, reading. But, see, he's having trouble figuring out, is it a square or a circle? And then, what, now it also affects colors, of course, such as your, the colors of your socks. Luckily, I had that figured out for tonight. <laughs> so I thought this fair. Um, but, we know it more for reading. And that's why there are systems like Kurzweil that will read to you. Um, and what it would do is flip letters and numbers. So for example, the number 4 can become the letter H, and vice versa. And also, when reading, you can skip entire lines. So you could read, the puppy was in the field, the end, and then have to figure out where you were. I then move to APD. Auditory Processing Disorder. This one, unlike most of them, has a number. 2 to 7 percent. That's how many children we think suffer from these issues. Now this is the exact opposite of VPD in that it deals with what you hear, not what you see. And a common scenario that I can think of is, let's say you're in a lecture heavy course, like, oh, I don't know, AP Euro. <laughs> Mr. Ormond is lecturing on the Spanish Inquisition. Suddenly, out of nowhere, fourth period lunch lets out. A flurry of footsteps and running throughout the hallways. You can't decide which noise to listen to first. That is APD. Now, I add another phantom. ADHD. Now, ADHD, you're thinking, but we've all heard of that. But it affects the other part of being a phantom. We all think of it as cured, but it's not. It's suppressed. Did you ever notice you have to keep taking the medication? 
Furthermore, the medication only acts for eight to 10 hours. After that, you're right back where you started. And then, it doesn't even cover all the symptoms. It just covers some of them. Picture the typical day of an ADHD child. You wake up in the morning, you take a shower, you eat breakfast, oh, and you get dressed. I have to remember that part. Um, then, you take your medication. Fast forward, it's the end of the day. You're back home, you're tired, it's dark out. Suddenly, your ADHD kicks back in and saying, woohoo, time to party. Oh, what, you had homework? Oh, that's not happening. Um, that is ADHD. Now, I did a survey to prove this point, that there are these issues that we don't know about. It was a survey of 32 people, and I did it at the regional farmer's market. Now, you're probably thinking, why 32? Because that's all the people that would talk to me. Um, now, dyspraxia, dyspraxia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. These are the lowest three that were known. However, everyone knew autism, and only one person, the same one person, did not know ADHD or dyslexia. This shows that there are many issues we don't know about. Now, I must stress, these are not death sentences. Parents, if your child has this issue, they will be fine, they will get into college. Children, if you have one of these issues, you still have to go through the hell known as Common App. Um, and many people have survived these. I've survived. I use a speech to text software when writing, so that teachers don't have to try and read whatever that was. Um, and I also play with sensory toys when my ADHD men wears off. Sometimes it's a plastic ball or some putty, or sometimes it's something a little more discreet. So for example, I've been playing with a sensory toy while I've been talking to all of you. My watch. Now, what can we do, the general public? Be understanding. Don't actively try and make things harder. If someone has a writing issue, do not give them a 10-page essay. Educate yourself. That means go on to sites such as understood.org by the National Center of Learning Disabilities, which has many simulations and articles for you to read. Or you can even ask me questions after these presentations. Parents, this does not mean go on to WebMD at 3 in the morning and assume that every worst case scenario is your own. Finally, don't overstep. That means don't go up to someone and say, excuse me, do you have special needs? Because, I only say this from experience. Because they will get very hurt very quickly. In conclusion, I know there are many issues out there that require attention, funding, and support. But there are some that could stand a little more limelight. Because maybe, just maybe, if we all pay attention a little bit, we may be able to conquer them. Thank you. which is your 12. The area behind you would be 6 o'clock, which is your 6. 6 o'clock is your most vulnerable spot in battle. So when someone tells you they got your 6, it means they have your back, and in return, you have theirs. Though here at home they are not dressed in uniform or armed on the battlefield, veterans have our backs, and as military protocol, we must have their backs as well. 
The struggles of addiction, homelessness, PTSD, and medical dependency seem to overshadow the progress and community service involving veterans in our society today. Haki Gherkin served in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Turkey, but when he returned home to his job as a Chicago police officer, he was quickly reminded of the violence in Chicago among the youth. So, Haki partnered up with Eli Williamson, who was also a veteran who served on the Chicago Police Force. The two created the Safe Passage Program. The Safe Passage Program serves 10,000 children daily and ensures safe passages for the Chicago public school students to and from school. The Chicago Police Department has even reported a 22% decrease in community and criminal activity around the communities the Safe Passage Program serves. People helping people is a powerful thing, and it is important to remember and honor the services our vets carry out at home. These vets have the sexes of over 10,000 children daily. Now isn't that something? Last year, I made it my mission to honor our vets in a unique way as I created my Girl Scout Gold Award project. I interviewed 25 residential veterans at the VA Medical Center and created biographies for them so that the doctors and nurses would have a better understanding of the patients they're treating and so that their loved ones can forever remember the sacrifices um, the veterans have made long after they pass. After interviewing, revising, typing, and framing their biographies, I presented them to the veterans at a Memorial Day service I organized and fundraised for. They were so thankful for the time I spent with them, and each one had their own amazing story. Here we have Clive. He's a World War II veteran. He was present at Battle of the Bulge, and he's 102 years old, and he's an incredible man. We would spend our Sunday mornings flipping through Lifetime magazines from the 1940s, laughing at the price of toothpaste or the models of cars. And Every now and then we would stumble across a picture from the war and he would point to a picture of a battle and say, hey, I was there. I would start bombarding him with questions, but his eyes would fill, fill with tears as he leaned back and said, I'm sorry, I just can't remember. And this is one of the driving forces behind my project as these men and women are getting older, their memories are getting fuzzier, and some are even suffering from dementia. Next we have Bill. He was drafted to serve in Vietnam when he was only 18 years old, and he attended Syracuse University upon returning home. And Bill and I loved talking about the SU games. He had a great sense of humor, and he always had a smile on his face, except for the Sunday morning after the Syracuse Duke game last year, which is a loss we both choose not to acknowledge. <laughs> and last, but not least, my dear friend Bud. He was a World War II vet, 96 years old, that's him on his 96th birthday. He was a paratrooper, and he spent 18, 18 months as a prisoner of war, and he is a double Purple Heart recipient. And he was my best friend at the VA. Um, next we have, here's Bud and I celebrating his 96th birthday, and next to it is him with his family at my Memorial Day picnic, and little did we know that that was the last day we all would spend with him. Um, Bud passed away peacefully in his sleep a week later, and when I arrived at the VA the next morning expecting to see him, I was devastated. And though I was heartbroken, I was honored to have been asked by his family to speak at his memorial service. As I sit at the podium in the presence of beloved loved ones, as I stand before you all tonight, I truly feel as though I have Bud six. Though I was nervous and emotional, I could feel Bud with me, reminding me that he had my six, just as I know he's with me tonight. By preserving the legacies of these incredible men and women, I have their backs. I thank God for the precious memories and unbelievable stories my heart has been filled with. I strongly encourage you all to invest your time in a project like mine. The VA is always looking for volunteers, and I promise these guys will make you laugh until you cry.
I believe in following in the footsteps of our country's great emancipator Abraham Lincoln, as he said, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. These individuals have risked their lives for the love of their country and to keep us safe. The least we can do is recognize their struggles and help the veterans solve them. We must work together to make them feel appreciated, safe, and worthy when they return home. Most importantly, we must preserve their stories for the future generations of our country. Next time you hear the word veteran, I hope you think of more than a soldier who has returned home from war. Think of the heroes in our community, like, like Hockey Gherkin, or even my hero, Bud. And most importantly, think of someone who will always have your six. Thank you. I'm going to begin my speech with a simple question. How many of you in the audience, if I gave you the choice between an organic food and a genetically modified food, would choose the organic food? I'm willing to bet that most of you would choose the organic food. And there are some common reasons why this would be. There's a lot of rumors that genetically modified organisms can cause cancer, that they increase allergen risk, and that they are degrading to the environment. And I used to think just like you. That's kind of where the story starts. It starts back in 2011 when I read a news article about how Greenpeace had attacked a scientific agency in Australia and mowed down $400,000 worth of genetically modified wheat that had been modified to have a lower glycemic index for people who had um, diseases such as diabetes. But as I got older and I thought more about it, I started to wonder, you know, why did people take these actions? Why were genetically modified organisms so bad? And that's where this presentation starts. So in order for you to learn about genetically modified organisms, I think we should have a good idea of what they are. So basically how a scientist makes a GMO is they take a gene from one organism and they insert it into the genetic code of another one. So they use various enzymes to do this. And what you get is a hybrid of the two. So for instance, a very common example is a lot of the salmon that we eat today is farm salmon. And what they've done is they've taken a gene from the Arctic flounder and inserted it into the salmon. And it allows the salmon to grow more continually. So they don't grow in seasonal cycles, but they grow continuous. And that allows for a much faster turnaround in terms of salmon farms. So now that you have a good idea of what constitutes a genetic modified organism, I would like to dispel one of the common rumors about them that we see in today's society. And that is that they cause cancer. This rumor is largely purported by the study that had images like this. Obviously, these are some pretty powerful images. This is a study done by Gael Sarini. He's a French scientist. And what he had done is he had purportedly taken mice, fed half of them genetically modified corn for two years, the other half, the control group, organic corn for two years, and then these were the mice that were uh, fed the gene genetically modified corn. But what he didn't tell you is that the mice that he used in that study were only meant to live 18 years. They were actually genetically modified to have a quicker life cycle so that they were better for laboratory conditions. So because of this, they, as programmed to be, did not show any tumor growth through the first 18th year of their lives. And then when they turned 18, they, you know, the kill um, switch within their cells activated and they started to grow these tumors. So what actually happened was in 2013, Gaia's study was revoked by the UK 
excuse me, the um, European Union's scientific agency. So he actually got it published in a much smaller paper. But it's widely considered within the scientific community that his results have not been replicated and are largely incorrect. And that is a fact. Now, another concern people have about genetically modified organisms is that they cause allergies. And this concern is more founded in reality. So basically, how an allergy works is if you're allergic to some sort of food, you're actually allergic to a specific protein or several proteins within that food. So let's say I have a soybean allergy. That means that there are several protein clusters within the soy actual plant that I'm allergic to. So when we look at the mechanism of allergies, the only way that a genetically modified organism would transmit an allergy is if someone deliberately took that gene cluster and put it into another organism without telling anyone. Which, while A being highly unlikely, it is B highly unethical. So the chances of that happening and making it through a peer-reviewed study and making it out of the market are incredibly unlikely. And I think this point is brought up by a study by the UK scientific agency that stated that today there have been no proven cases in which a genetically modified food has caused a food allergy. And I think that's important to realize. And in fact, the opposite has been proven true. There's uh, currently a project between the University of Arkansas and the chemical company DuPont to make genetically modified soybeans that are absent of the proteins that cause allergens to people. So what this would mean is that eating this particular type of soy would make it so people with a soybean allergy would not be allergic to it. And I think that that's a great you know, benefit of modern medicine. Speaking of the benefits of genetically modified organisms, I'd like to talk a bit about the Golden Rice Project. So, in order to talk about the Golden Rice, I have to talk a little bit about vitamin A deficiency. And all the areas in red are areas in the world that are severely vitamin A deficient. And what vitamin A deficiency does is it impairs people's immune systems, especially young children. So while vitamin A deficiency doesn't kill people outright, what it does is it increases the mortality rate in children by 50%. So these children are dying of diseases like malaria and cholera at much higher rates. That's impacting their education, their health, the very stability of these countries. And what the Golden Rice Project aims to do, it's a nonprofit by a group of bioengineers and genealogists, is they've created golden rice. And what it is is it's rice that contains beta carotene a precursor chemical in our body for vitamin A. So what we do with genetically modified organisms is give these people rice plants that contain elevated levels of beta carotene and fight vitamin A deficiency. If there's a cause less noble than helping children live a full and valuable life, I'd like to hear it. So the, this is a list of my sources just so everyone knows that well researched. <laughs> But, you know, my concluding statements behind this is that we can't just judge genetically modified organisms because they're genetically modified. We have to judge them for what's actually been done to them, what benefit they cause and what they can hurt. I'm not up here defending chemical companies like DuPont and Monsanto. You know, they've, it's been documented that they use, you know, questionable practices to push small farmers out of business and a lot of their genetic experiment, so to say, could be seen as unethical. But that doesn't mean that there aren't tremendous good that can be created from genetically modified foods. I think that we should view it as a tool, a means to an end, that humans can use to make the world a better place. Thank you. this speech off with a simple question. Would you rather have more money or less money? More money, raise your hand. More money. 
As you can see, almost everyone in the audience would rather have more money. But the way America thinks about the economy does not appear to be the case. In fact, a study by Bloomberg News shows that only 21% of people believe that the economic downturn affected them. 21%. That's only one in five. That shows that most Americans don't just not know about the economy, they just don't care. But the thing is, the economy affects everyone. And by investing or saving your money, you can put your financial stability ahead. One thing you might be telling me is, oh, investing is a smart man's game. I'm not smart enough to do that. But just ask billionaire investor and sometimes richest man in the world, Warren Buffett, when he says, if you have 120 or 130 IQ points, you can afford to give the rest away. You do not need extraordinary intelligence to succeed as an investor. This is not just coming from any random Joe. This is coming from Warren Buffett, who has been a premier investor for the last half of a century. Another thing you might be telling me is, why do I have to do anything with my money? It's not going anywhere. Well, it kind of is. You see, there's something called inflation. Inflation is when over time, your money gets less value because there's just more money flooding the system. As you can see, inflation has occurred in almost every year since 1989, except for one. On average, your money loses about 3% of its value each year. Therefore, if you were to wait just this short amount of time, you'd have lost almost half or maybe even two-thirds of your money's value. Thus, investing, or saving your money, is pertinent to everyone's financial security. One thing you can do is simply save up some of your money. A lot of teenagers here in the audience have part-time jobs. Now, let's imagine you're working 10 hours a week and you're making about minimum wage. If you were to just save half of your money, half, which means you can spend the rest on things teens love, like playing video games and going on dates, then you would have $3,000 after 15 months. 15 months is not a very long amount of time. It's about how long the current juniors have until they graduate, which means that if you would like $3,000 in your wallet to buy maybe a car, a used car, or, a part, or um, some college textbooks, you can do that by simply saving up some of the money and enjoying the rest of it. Another thing you can do is to ask people to give you money or stocks for Christmas. This is a good thing to do because many of your Christmas presents are usually not used more after, like, January 9th. <laughs> I mean, let's do that. Or maybe your birthday. Maybe you get something fun from your grandma and grandpa, but you realize that it's never going to be used again. Therefore, saving or trying to get more money is a great way of investing in your financial security. Another place you can look for is the stock market. The stock market is basically buying little tiny pieces of a company. When that company does well, the stock price increases and you get more money. Now, when that startup company does badly, you lose money. So what you might be trying to tell me is, well, Matthew, why should I invest if I might lose money? Now, here's the thing you probably won't lose money. The following is a logarithmic scale, which means as you move up on the graph, the value increases by 10 times. Thus, the money, the value of stocks in the Dow Jones, which is about the top 500 or so biggest, most valuable companies, has grown by many orders of magnitude in the last 100 years. Another thing you might try and tell me is, I wasn't around 100 years ago, why should I care how much it's improved in the last 100 years? Well, it's still improved very much in the last 10 years, as you can see. And it's very important to know that you can make lots of money if you just put stocks in and take them out when you retire. Another place you might look for is the bond market. A bond is basically a loan. When someone puts out a bond, they're looking for a certain amount of money for someone to give them, with a promise that they'll pay back with interest as soon as they can. But an organization like the government knows that they will always pay you back no matter what. With this, however, they will not pay you back with much interest due to the security. Something like a small startup company, however, knows the risks involved in funding them, so they'll give you lots more money if they succeed. Thus, bonds can be risky in the same way the stock market can. 
You can gain a little money, gain a lot of money, lose a little money, or even lose a lot of money. Thus, it's important to know the risks involved. To recap, let's look at some simple facts. If you were to invest $1 in 1997, which is when a lot of the juniors and seniors were born, you would have $3.23 today. While this doesn't seem so spectacular, notice that you only invested a dollar. Therefore, it could have become $3,230, or even $3,230,000. Saving just $1,000 a year until you retire would net you $118,000. That's a lot of money, and that's more than twice what you would put in. And buying 50 Apple stock for $50 back in 1998, when it was just a small company, would still net you $65,000. That's more than 1,000 times as much as they were worth. In conclusion, investing and putting your faith in the economy is an important thing that every American and everybody in the world must do. I hope I've shown you that the economy affects everyone, so march forth and invest. we must first understand why. The brain processes music in a completely unique way. Research shows that playing an instrument stimulates numerous areas of the brain at once, compared with other activities which will typically only engage one or two areas. As you can see, playing an instrument generates a significantly greater degree of brain activity than does the resting mind. It also causes more brain waves in activities like playing chess, solving puzzles, reading, or even doing math problems. This is because playing an instrument requires nearly every area of the brain, but especially the motor, auditory, and visual cortices. Just thinking about this makes sense. Every day, musicians must use fine motor skills, mathematical precision, creativity, and audio and visual comprehension in order to be successful. Not surprisingly, all of these factors combined improve the overall functioning of the brain, which can then be applied to other activities. One of the most noticeable benefits of playing a musical instrument is the elevated level of scholastic aptitude. First, playing music has been shown to significantly increase long-term memory. In one study, preschoolers who learned to play an instrument had a 34% better memory function compared to those who did not. Musicians remember events and ideas for longer and understand them better. Largely because of this, music offers many academic advantages. Typically, children who play instruments show increased abilities in mathematics, critical reading, and foreign language comprehension. They show larger vocabularies, improved reading skills, and have a longer retention of verbal information. And this holds true across all socioeconomic divisions. In addition, other studies have shown that students involved in music performance classes have increased spatial temporal IQ scores, higher SAT scores, and a greater number of A and B grades on their report cards, compared to students who did not participate. It makes sense that musical students perform better in school. 
Music makes you smarter. It helps you to succeed academically. Even the infamous College Board lists music in the arts as one of the six basic subject areas that students should be familiar with in order to succeed in college. In addition, instrumental music has also been shown to produce numerous other benefits to life outside of school, the first of which is lower substance abuse rates. Studies show that students who participated in band or chorus in high school show both the lowest school-wide and lifelong use of illicit substances, including drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Music education is also strongly correlated with lower disciplinary issues, with a smaller percentage of music participants classified as disruptive than their non-musical peers. Also, according to the National Arts Research Education Center, students involved in music showed significant increases in graduation rates, self-esteem, and determination. This may be because playing an instrument requires hard work and practice, which can then be applied to the rest of a person's life. But whatever the reason, playing an instrument can bring lifelong success. While all of these benefits are extremely important, many student musicians believe that their involvement in music education has had numerous other important effects on their lives. To test this theory, I asked 50 musicians a simple question. Has playing an instrument had a positive impact on your life? I surveyed both amateur and professional musicians, and everyone from high school band members to a Juilliard student to a successful lawyer who takes the lessons on the side. And though I acknowledge that 50 isn't the largest sample size, the results were unanimous. 100% of those surveyed said that yes, music has benefited their life in some way. Participants describe music as something I love, who I am, and something that has brought me so much happiness. With results like these, I personally cannot think of any better argument in support of music education. Despite the clear and tremendous benefits of music, music education programs are being cut worldwide. Even here at James Little DeWitt, the self-proclaimed greatest school in the universe, instrumental music programs for fourth graders have been on the chopping block twice within the past five years alone. But why would anyone want to eliminate a program that has been so clearly proven to change students' lives for the better? I don't know, but I can tell you that you have the power to help stop it from happening. How? First, use your voice. Speak out against and vote down budget proposals that wrongfully eliminate music in our schools. Write to your board representatives and government officials and let them know why music is so important. Next, support music in the community. Attend concerts and participate and encourage the growth of local music programs. The next JD Band concert will be held right here on the 17th. And in Syracuse, we are lucky enough to have our own professional symphony orchestra called Symphoria. Their next concert is on March 13th, and admission is free for anyone aged 18 or under, so probably a lot of you are out in the audience. Encourage your children, students, or peers to get involved, and together, no pun intended, we can create something that is truly noteworthy. Thank you. I believe that all people felt the same way that I did and felt that this procedure was wrong. 
I thought it was illegal until I discovered that it is legal everywhere in the United States. I was troubled that some were doing this to our future generation. I explored the other side of the issue called pro-choice, and I did more research, and I became even more passionate on my pro-life or anti-abortion opinion. A common pro-choice argument is that we don't know when life really begins. This is a good point that people are making, and scientific evidence does provide some answers. The child in the womb has the characteristics of living things like metabolism and growth. The child also has its own genetic comp composition that is unique and different from any other human that has ever existed, including the mother, which disproves the claim that an abortion is only about a woman and her body. It's also about a child's life. The child in the womb is composed of human DNA and other human molecules, so it's undeniably human. The subjective evidence shows that at the moment of fusion of sperm and egg, a child comes into existence, which is distinctively human, alive, and an individual organism. In all 50 states, abortion is legal in certain stages of pregnancy, depending on the state. But if a child were born, let's say, 20 weeks early, I feel that we can all agree that this is human. So let's agree to call that same unborn child 20 weeks before delivery a human too. People who are pro-choice also point out that the child in the womb depends on the mother and cannot live on its own. This is correct and I completely agree. And I believe that people who are pro-choice will agree that after birth, the child still can't live on their own and still depends on other people for help. Therefore, let's agree that a life is a life, even if it does depend on others. Abortions have taken place every day since the 1970s, and these people, if they had been able to live their lives, would be at most 45 years old. Sometimes we can't help but think, where would these people be now? Who, who would they be friends with, and would they already have a family of their own? These people could have become doctors, teachers, scientists, or even your best friend, and they could have affected all of our lives for the better. The possibilities are endless. We could already have a cure for Ebola or cancer or AIDS if these lives were given a chance to fully live. I think that we can all agree that when becoming sexually active, there's a big responsibility. So, if you're choosing to have sex, please communicate with your partner about ways to prevent unwanted pregnancy, like using protection or birth control. But make sure that you know that every time people have sex, they're taking a risk because birth control methods don't always work. And we need to take responsibility when these methods fail. Let's support someone who's going through any type of hard time during their pregnancy. We need to take responsibility as a society to help. At feministforlife.org, it gives women resources who cannot afford to have a baby. This website gives women, I mean, this website helps women find clothing, housing, furniture, and temporary shelter. The website also gives links to other foundations, like charities, to help the woman and the child have better lives. Other ways a pregnant woman can get and you can get resources is through Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, previously known as Food Stamps, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, also known as TANF, WIC, also known as Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program, Medicaid, and CatholicCharitiesUSA.org, which is willing to help anyone despite their religious, social, and economic background. And there are many more links to different programs to help pregnant women in the Resources for Pregnant Women, Birth Parents, and Birth Mothers section under Resources at the Feminist for Life website. There's another solution that can help even more people in society, and that is adoption. Today, many couples are getting married and they want to start a family, but many factors can make a couple unable to have a child. Adoption and foster care are a good decision to help save a life. We can help everyone in society, including people in early stages of life, women who aren't pregnant, and pregnant women who are in difficult circumstances. By doing so, we can help all these people, plus families hoping to adopt. Thank you. The next speech tonight is by Emily O'Connor, a, a senior at JV and also a Gen veteran. Emily is very involved in student government, the Spanish club, and musical. She will be attending Skidmore College next year to study neuroscience. Here's Emily with her talk, Thirsty for Equality. state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities, according to Oxford Dictionary. 
Although we like to think that all people are equal in this modern world, that is sadly not the case. In many areas, such as Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, women are unequal to their male counterparts in status, education, and employment. So how can we help women gain equality? Well, one of the ways is through water. Yes, water. The correlation between water insecurity and the lack of gender equality is often not brought up, but is one of the most important and underrated parts of this crisis. Almost everyone knows about the lack of, equal of, the lack of water in many of these countries, but the lesser known part of the water crisis is how it affects women and their equality. This is the part that people are ignorant about and often push aside so as not to have to talk about. There is a cycle of education and equality that can only be met if women are given access to the water they need and deserve. In order to give women equality, we must give them education. And in order for them to have the time and resources in order to get an education, we must help them to get water. I first became so interested in this crisis when I learned that it takes women an average of over six hours each day in order to collect water to support their families. In many countries, because of gender stereotypes and hierarchy, it is the job of the women and children to gather the water each day. As a woman, I find it horrifying and wish to stop this problem going forward so women have the equal opportunities they deserve and everyone has the water that they need. In many areas, there is some sort of access to water, but because of economic problems, social hierarchy, and gender inequality, these countries force women into problems because they don't have access to safe and clean water. In addition, some of these places might have access to enough clean and safe water, but water lords take over the wells and streams in order to make a profit. Women spend hours upon hours each day walking to streams, waiting in line, and walking back with barely enough water to support their families rather than being able to spend their days getting an education and employment they deserve. In Africa, 90% of the work of gathering water is done by women and girls who therefore aren't able to attend school to get an education and progress with a job like their male counterparts. According to water.org, the amount of time spent each day by women and children amounts to over 200 million hours consumed which could be used for education, business, and caring for themselves and others. This number of hours is equivalent to building the Empire State Building, not just once, but 28 times each day. Women walk an average of six kilometers per day to gather water and carry 40 to 50 pound jugs on their head and backs, causing damage to bones, internal organs, and the brain. It is not only physical health that is affected, however, mental health plays a huge role. These areas that women and children are sent to in order to gather water or go to the bathroom are unsafe and they often get attacked and even raped. Females often drop out of school once they eat, reach the age of puberty because of embarrassment over menstruation and not being able to go to a proper bathroom or have access to water while at school. It is absurd that all throughout the world, women are suffering physically, economically, <laughs> mentally, and academically from a resource which every person on this planet should have access to. This water scarcity creates an imbalance of power that continues to exploit the inequalities of women. A lack of water means a lack of equality, and in order to provide women and girls with equal opportunities, we must help them get access to water. So what can you do to support these women and give them the equality they deserve? Well, one of the main ways to give women water is through supporting organizations that get to the root of the problem and give women access to an abundance of clean and safe water and sanitation right in their village. Take, for an instance, a woman by the name of Poppy from Savar, Bangladesh. She and her husband were able to take out a loan through water crack, in order to install a submersile pump at home so they could have safe water just outside their doors. Now, instead of wasting all of her time gathering water 
and not allowing herself or her children education, Poppy can get a job to support her family and embrace all the opportunities she used to miss out in the village. She thanks all who helped her get access to water and says, I am happy that my children will not know the water crisis like I did before. And this is all because of water credit. And you, every single person in this audience, can help make success stories like this come true. Organizations such as Water Credit allow the technique of microfinance to be used in order to put money into wells and building toilets in order to have everyone have access to the water they deserve. What microfinance does is it allows women and children to use the money that they make in order to pay back the loan and that money goes into the next woman in need and so on down the line until there is no space on earth that doesn't have access to water. Every one dollar invested in water is eight dollars in return because of saved time, increased productivity, and reduced health care costs. So why not help? It's imperative that you make donations to charities such as Water Credit, Water.org, and TheWaterProject.org so that they can use that money to help communities dig wells, construct small subsurface dams, catch rainwater, protect springs, and educate villages about proper sanitation and hygiene. In order to help end the inequality of women, we must help give them access to water. And you, as individuals and as a community, must support charities, donate, educate yourself, and most importantly, spread the word so we can give everyone a clean drink of water and women the equality they deserve. Thank you. schizophrenic Keith Fidel. Keith's parents had made a 911 call hoping to get their son treatment when he was experiencing an episode of psychosis. The 90-pound Keith was pinned on the floor by two officers when Bassey shot him. Bassey had been on the scene for just over a minute. Encounters between the police and those with mental illnesses have been increasing as mental health hospitals have been closed and services have been slashed and too often those encounters end like Vidal's. Half of those the police kill, at least half the people the police kill have a mental illness. So I think that most people could agree with me when I say that the police need better training when it comes to handling those with mental health problems. But they aren't the only ones. We all do, because even though it may not seem like mental illness affects your life or the life of anyone you know, it does. One in four Americans are living with a mental health problem. But even though it's such a prevalent issue, we don't talk about it. And so most people with mental illnesses will never seek help because of fear of judgment. And if we're ever going to change that, we first have to look at how we perceive mental illness. Now, I want you to think for a moment about how many of the words on the screen you've used as figures of speech. I know I hear them all the time. And I don't blame anyone for using these words, because I used to do it without thinking what I was saying. But when we use mental illnesses as, hy as hyperboles and adjectives, we're belittling the these disorders and the people who have them. And we're conflating medical conditions with normal human emotions and behaviors. And I've been told that I'm just being politically correct before, but I'm just recognizing another human being's struggles as valid. And shouldn't that just be human decency? And the way we talk and think about mental health is extremely important. Because so many times when someone is brave enough to tell someone what they're going through, they'll get dismissed. They'll get things like, everyone gets depressed once in a while. 
or just saying positively, or my personal favorite, have you ever tried not having depression? You see, we have a tendency to view mental illnesses in one of three ways. Either we trivialize them, we demonize them, and we romanticize them. They are either a sign that one is a serial killer, just a phase, or a tragically beautiful aspect of one's character. We see them in these ways because most Americans simply don't know a lot about mental health. Most Americans report that they get their information about mental health from the media, which is clearly problematic. We're shown images of mental illnesses when they're at their most extremes. We forget that most people's symptoms are not nearly this overt. And so, we're shown images like this, and we can say, okay, this is what someone with an eating disorder looks like. And this is what a psychopath looks like. But most people with mental health problems don't look like this. At least half of the people with eating disorders are or have been overweight. And, and because of this, they can go years without treatment or diagnosis. And because eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of all mental illnesses, early intervention is critical, and yet it rarely happens. And the, psychopath, and the violent psychopath is also a myth. The contribution of people with mental illnesses to the overall rates of violence is low. In fact, they're more likely to hurt themselves than they are to hurt others. 90% of people who commit suicide have a mental illness. Our views have become so distorted that we've literally made having a mental, condition, mental illness a crime. Americans with mental illnesses are three times more likely to be in jail than they are to be in a psychiatric hospital. And those people in prison rarely get the treatment that they need. Most of the mentally ill in jail are therefore misdemeanors or minor felonies, but a lot of them will get extras, will receive longer sentences for misbehavior, which might as well translate to having an untreated mental illness. This is all part of the stigma of mental illness. In the mental health community, you'll often hear this word used. It comes from the Greek word meaning to tattoo or to brand. It's a mark of shame. Something that sets you apart from others. Something that keeps you on the outside. I read an article recently by a Dr. Jeffrey Lieberman. He was responding to a New York Times article about how hearing voices is apparently normal and not a symptom of a psychiatric disorder. And there was one quote in particular that I liked. Quote, Psychiatry has the dubious distinction of being the only medical specialty with an anti-movement. There is an anti-psychiatry movement. You've never heard of an anti-cardiology movement, an anti-dermatology movement, or an anti-orthopedics movement, unquote. Why is that? Why is it that the brain is the only organ in our body that can get sick, for lack of a better term, and instead of sympathy, sufferers get silenced, dismissed, or at their worst, killed or thrown in jail? We know that mental illness is real. We've isolated genes that may predispose a, per a person to develop a mental condition. And brain scans can show both the functional and the structural differences in the brains of those who have mental illnesses and those who are healthy. But the truth is that we still don't know a lot. Psychology and psychiatry are both very young sciences and they're both handling, and they're both trying to answer questions about what may be the most complex thing we've ever had to deal with, our own brains. But I hope that if science develops a more objective view of mental health, we'll accept it more. But until then, until then, we can only educate ourselves and try to educate others. We have what's called a finite pool of worry. It basically means that there's a finite number of things we can spend time worrying about. And unfortunately, mental health is often left out. But this is an issue that can't be pushed to the back of our minds. Because mental illness affects so many people, and it doesn't just have one face. People like Buzz Aldrin, Abraham Lincoln, Sylvia Plath, J.K. Rowling, Charles Dickens, Isaac Newton, Billy Joel, and John Green. 
They all are dealing with or have dealt with mental illness. And those aren't the only ones. Even normal people you walk by on the street every day. People like me. It can affect anyone. And it could have the face of someone that you love. If you are struggling with a mental health problem or think you may be, please seek help. And please don't be afraid to ask for it. I know it's scary, and I know it's hard, but I also know that it's worth it. I know that whatever you're going through is valid, and I know that you're never alone. And I know that there's always someone who will listen. Thank you. of a Hispanic. We have to first separate culture from stereotyping. A stereotype is where you see one group portrayed in one light so much that you think the next person that you see that fits that group will fit that light. The first assumption I'd like to point out is a generalization that the media play that portrays about the appearance of a true Hispanic person and what they should look like. Hispanic women are known to be sexy. They have been pointed out through their curvy body, dark skin, dark hair, and their blunt and extravagant attitude. Take a second and look at me. I am not dark skin. I consider myself pretty petite. And I was born a blonde. And I am a Latina. And I'm sure if you get on the bad side of anyone, the response won't be so positive. So the fact that this sterilization is made a lot through the media is ridiculous because a person can't assume ethnic backgrounds due to their appearance or a of her, how a person acts. Another very common generalization in, that I encounter is that Hispanic women are all maids and men are delinquents. This generalization is probably one of the most offensive to me because I know several Hispanics that are not maids nor are delinquents. In the movie Made in Manhattan, Jennifer Lopez plays a maid in the movie, and she is Hispanic. And Selena Gomez plays a role in Cinderella story in which she is an outcast, and she's from Hispanic heritage. And even in Family Guy, Consuela is made fun of and ridiculized. Throughout the news, we are constantly hearing about illegal immigrants and drug trafficking, and all being attached to Hispanics. We aren't all drug trafficking, traffickers or illegal.
was I had my first dad. Last, but certainly not least, is the highly intelligent and open-minded senior Joshua. Good evening, everyone. Last year, I spoke to you about the importance of voting. This past November, in the most recent election, voter turnout was around 30%. That means that 70% of you weren't listening very well. <laughs> this year, I'm going to tell you about the three biggest threats to American democracy, and how we can fix them to make sure that 100% of people can vote in 2016. Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution says that every state is required to have a representative government. Our nation was founded and built on democracy. In this country, we have the right to vote for officials to represent us in the government. Throughout our past, attempts to limit, sorry, <laughs> attempts to limit our right to vote have tarnished our nation's reputation. From poll taxes to literacy tests, these discriminatory policies have limited our nation's full democratic potential. In modern America, these laws have been overturned and replaced with new forms of voter suppression. Voter ID laws discriminate against those who have never needed certain types of identi identification before. Gerrymandering, or redistricting, creates a system built to make your vote count less. And relentless spending on campaigns takes democracy and bankrolls it from the pockets of the wealthy. To try and solve these attacks on our democracy, we need to fully understand how our rights are being threatened. In 1950, South Carolina became the first state to issue an ID requirement before voting. Since then, many states have followed their lead. These laws are put into place because certain officials claim that there is mass voter fraud throughout the United States. But countless studies say that that's false. To quote the Federal Assistance Election Commission, there is widespread agreement that there is little to no polling place fraud. Claiming voter fraud is simply a mask for the true intention of these lawmakers. These laws are usually put into place to make voting harder for certain groups of people who don't usually need IDs, like, uh, like lower income voters or minorities. For example, in Wisconsin, where you need a photo ID to vote, Around 50% of African Americans don't have a photo ID, and 40% of Hispanic Americans don't have a photo ID. That means they can't vote. In our Constitution, you are not guaranteed a free photo ID. However, you are guaranteed the right to vote. Furthermore, six of the 16 states that have passed voter ID laws since 2010 have a documented history of discriminating against minority voters. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> voter ID laws are simply ways to suppress voting and find new ways to discriminate against minorities. Another form of voter suppression found its roots and its eccentric name in 1812, when the governor of Massachusetts decided to do a little redistricting. The governor decided to use his political power to redraw the boundaries of the state's senatorial districts to exclude members of the opposing party. When he was done, Elbridge Jerry had created a distorted map with one district that resembled the shape of a salamander, hence the name Gerrymander. I guess that's what salamanders looked like in 1812. <laughs> in modern America, there are two types of gerrymandering, racial and political. They're very closely knit, but only one of them is specifically banned by the United States Supreme Court. In 1960, the court said that the city of Tuskegee, Alabama, could not change the boundaries of the city from, quote, a square to a 28-sided figure that excluded nearly all of the African Americans in the city. This was an attempt to exclude African Americans from having their voice heard where they live, and it's a form of racial gerrymandering that is now illegal. However, political gerrymandering is still alive and happens every 10 years after the census is taken and legislatures can redraw their districts. For example, here's North Carolina's 12th district after some clever gerrymandering that worked its way, that worked its way around the state to group certain cities together where all the Democrats were voting. This is, um, yeah. 
<laughs> this happens all the time. Districts are drawn to exclude certain people and throw off the balance of the electorate. This happens in every state and occurs on both sides of the aisle. Furthermore, when you create districts that are solely one party, like this district, their representatives can act as radical as they want because they'll know that they'll get reelected. This increases, this increases political polarization by creating safe districts for specific parties. The final and most disturbing issue is campaign finance. Last November marked the most expensive election in our nation's history. A total of $3.7 billion was spent on campaigning. $3.7 billion. Just to give you a little perspective on how much that really is, with that money we can send 24,000 kids to K-12 education. Also, with less than 10% of that $3.7 billion, we can feed 2 million Syrian refugees. The history of money in politics goes back centuries, but the floodgates to corporate sponsorship of American democracy were opened five years ago. In 2010, the Supreme Court decided in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission that corporations could spend unlimited amounts of money on political campaigns. That means that corporations like BP, for example, can donate millions of dollars to candidates who will say things about global warming like, quote, it's absolutely and utterly untrue. Senator Rand Paul. <laughs> this money goes to everything from these relentless ads that we have to sit through to buying a candidate lunch. When our nation spends $3.7 billion, no one benefits. When, uh, when elections can be influenced by corporate donations, our democracy begins to crack. Yes, it seems dark and dreary in our current state of democratic illegitimacy. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot that we, as individuals, can do. But don't you worry. You've already completed the first step towards solving this issue. Because the first step in any problem is recognizing that there is one. Now that we know about the current threats and attacks on American, dem on American democracy, we can keep this in our minds the next time we vote. We need to elect officials who see these issues and their need for reform. We need to vote, or we need to write to our representatives to tell them that we don't think it's okay when people can't vote because of biased voter ID laws. We need to tell them that gerrymandering and manipulation of our democracy needs to stop. We need to tell them that we're not allowing our nation to be hijacked by the wealthy through corporate donations. We need to tell them to fix our democracy. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like all of the lovely Jed participants to join me on the stage, please. express your opinions and say it so eloquently about so many important issues, I think they deserve a standing ovation. And uh, Elizabeth uh, earlier in her talk referenced uh, James Will DeWitt as being the greatest high school in the universe. <laughs> And the reason it is, is because of the students. We have the greatest students in the universe. Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. And also, um, a big, big thanks to Mrs. Romeiser, Mrs. Lopetisano, and Mrs. Tyler. Thank you. 
here at GD, and they just need a huge round of applause because they do amazing.